Hey y'all. Tell them hello. It's Miss Coco. She's in every video. If you are a returning subscriber, thank you. Thank you. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Sarah. And today we are going to talk some true crime. Today we're going to talk about Gerald Jimmy Bordelon. Gerald was born in 1962 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He attended some schools around Baton Rouge, but his mom eventually ended up just pulling him out altogether because the principal told her like, mm, I think you need to go ahead and just maybe homeschool him. So she took him to some psychiatrists. And how can I say this? And YouTube still like me. He was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and sh sexual sadism disorder. There we go. Y'all yeah, yeah, can figure out what that first word is supposed to be. He was diagnosed with those. Uh, he committed his first crime in 1979 where he S assaulted an 18 year old S assault yeah we'll just say S assault because y'all 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 are gonna know he S aid an 18 year old and they put him in a men mental institution for two years let him back out So he's out in 81. In 82, he snatches up another 18 year old. Just right up, just, just snatch her right up. And guess what he does? That's right, he S assaults her too. Mm hmm. He got 10 years for that. But. Good behavior. He didn't do 10 years. Mm -mm 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 -mm. He was let go early for good behavior. So in 1990, he offers a 22 year old woman a ride. And as soon as she gets in the car, he pulls a knife on her and S assaults her as well. We see a pattern here. He gets 20 years for this crime in 1990. Well, for good behavior, he's out by 2000. So that's less than 10 years off of his 20 year sentence. Yeah, okay. So, in 2001, a lady by the name of Jennifer LeBlanc put an ad in the paper for a go-kart. And Gerald said, you know, I've got a daughter. I bet she would like this go-kart. He had many daughters, actually, but just one that he saw regularly. So he, you know, answers this go-kart ad and him and Jennifer just really hit it off. They just met over this go-kart and they're like, hmm, I think, you know, we really like each other. So they start dating. And he's on parole now at, at this time. So um, if, if you're new here and you're not a returning subscriber, you're gonna hear Coco grunt because there you go. She falls asleep in, in every video and, and she grunts, so there she goes. Anyway, so he's on parole when he meets Jennifer, who by the way, has three daughters. She's got twins and then she has Courtney LeBlanc, who is her youngest child. So the twins are older than Courtney. Courtney lives with her full time. The twins do not. They just, you know, visit with her. So, 
I'm not sure if Gerald told Jennifer about his past of horrible stuff he likes to do to women. But I do know that at some point the parole board did tell her like, hey, this, you know, he has a past of essaying young women and you have three daughters. And she was apparently okay with it. I mean, that, mm -mm, that, that would, that, sorry, that, that had been a deal breaker for me. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, nope. But she's okay with it and they get married in June of 2001. In December of 2001, one of the twins and Courtney, the youngest, tell her, hey, mom, Gerald has touched us inappropriately. Courtney even called like a, a helpline and said, you know, my stepdad has touched me inappropriately. So not only did Courtney, the youngest, not only did she tell her mom, she called hotline. So, you know, her mom separated from Gerald. Oh, by the way, go back for a second. When they got married in June of 2001, he moved them to Gloucester, Mississippi. I left that part out. So they're in Gloucester, Mississippi now. So these allegations of him touching the, 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 her two daughters, this is in Mississippi. So she separates from Gerald and moves back to Louisiana. So she's now in Denham Springs, Louisiana. And the grand jury in Mississippi decided there wasn't enough evidence to prosecute Gerald. And it could have been that the, the girls, uh, Jennifer's girls, one of the twins and then Courtney, they didn't show up to testify at the grand jury. Now, I don't know if their mama didn't let them show up, but th there, there was two times they were supposed to show up to testify and they didn't. So that's why they decided they're not going to prosecute him. And... I also think she moved to Louisiana to to get away from what was you know, the legal stuff in Mississippi because she didn't separate from him. Oh no no no, mm -mm. no she didn't. Nope, no, because when she moved into her trailer in Denham Springs, Louisiana, it needed some electrical work done, and Gerald just happened to be an electrician so he's like I'll come over there and fix that right up for you and what's crazy about it is he's doing electrical work and he shocks himself Courtney has to call 911 and Courtney again is the youngest daughter that he is inappropriately touched she calls 911 and does CPR and saves his life. Ugh, she had to be disgusted having to give him CPR. So fast forward a couple of months and it was a couple of months after Courtney saved. So it's around October or November of 2002. Jennifer LeBlanc, Courtney's mom, her brother, so that would be Courtney's uncle, since it's Jennifer's brother, he gets into a bad car accident, like an 18-wheeler hits him. So Courtney and Jennifer go to the hospital, and, you know, they're, they're sitting there, and, and she's like, oh, we're just going to stay here with you tonight because this is, this is bad, 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 bad. And Courtney's like, mom, I have a book report that, I need to get done and one of Jennifer's friends was there and she's like well I'll take her home you know I'll, I'll 
take her home with me. And Jennifer, yeah, Jennifer was like, okay. Courtney's mom was like, okay, that's, that's fine. I'm gonna stay here with my brother. You'll take Courtney with you. She can do her book report, that's fine. Well, somehow Courtney talked this lady that was supposed to be taking her home with her, talked her into just letting her go back to her house, the one, the trailer that she lived in with Jennifer. And the lady was like, I don't know, you're 12. She's 12. What? No, you're not staying by yourself overnight. No, oh, no, uh -uh. I don't think so. Mm -mm. But anyway, she talks this lady into letting her stay by herself overnight in this trailer. So, y'all. Courtney's mama, Jennifer, comes home from the hospital around noonish the next day. Courtney's not there. So, she calls everybody that she knows, Courtney's friends, this lady, everybody, you know, do you know where Courtney is? And we well, finally gets around calling the police. And the police come out and she's just like, I don't know where she could have gone. You know, I don't know where she is. She was supposed to be doing her book report and this and that. And so, the you know, the police and... Side note, at the same time, and I, I vividly remember this because I was going to LSU at this time and it was terrifying, but we had two serial killers in the Baton Rouge area at this time and I don't know if they had figured out that there was two of them at this time or if they still thought it was just one person at the time but one of the victims of one of the serial killers owned a business that was about three to five minutes from where Courtney was kidnapped from from her home like she was kidnapped from her home and so the FBI was already here because of the serial killer. So they jumped in with Courtney and, and we're like, okay, we, you know, we're, we, we've got to get to search and see what's going on. Well, the police get a call from one of Jennifer's family members like, bring, bring. hey, by the way, did you know that Courtney's stepfather is a S offender? like registered and everything he's yeah mm-hmm yep he mm-hmm yeah he's he's bad guy y'all might want to look at him so the police start looking at like media footage and they see Gerald Bordelon giving interviews with his missing flyers with his you know the flyers they made up for Courtney you know with her like date of birth and blonde hair, blue eyes. It was said that she had like these really, really, really like intense, pretty, pretty blue eyes. So he was holding these flyers and talking to the media and they noticed that he just didn't really show very much emotion when talking. Just just not, not a whole lot of emotion. So they're thinking, first of all, these serial killers have not killed a child before because a 12 year old is a child she was a child they haven't kidnapped killed any children before so probably not one of the serial killers it's it's probably this this Gerald Bordelon we're, we're gonna go ahead and go with that so they start surveillance on him and they start following him around from his parents' place in Gloucester, Mississippi, Louisiana. He goes to all these random different places. And at one point, they lose him. And then they catch back up with him at a cemetery in Gloucester, Mississippi. And this MFR, MFR, this sick MFR is walking around the cemetery in Gloucester, Mississippi with a stack of Courtney's missing flyers 
flyers. I know I'm country, oh. so it sounds like, I don't know what that sounds like. She's snoring. She's snoring. Oh. 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 She just asses out oh. when it's time to film. She's like, all right, this is my chance to nap. And that's what she does. Okay. So, yeah, they catch up with him in the cemetery. Flyers. God, I'm country. Flyers. So, he's just walking around the cemetery at 3 a.m. with a stack of missing person, with a stack of Courtney's missing person flyers, and they're just like, how do we go about confronting him? So, they, like, get in touch with the FBI, and the FBI is like, we'll do this, and they're like, okay. So they just walk up to him. Hey, what you doing in the cemetery walking around with Courtney's missing person flyers? Like, what are you doing at three o'clock in a cemetery in, in Gloucester, Mississippi? What are you doing, Gerald? What are you doing? And he's like, oh, oh, no, no, no. I wasn't burying a body. Well, that's not what we asked you, Jared. We didn't say, are you burying a body here? We said, what are you doing? So that's a very odd response to our question. And then he's like backpedaling. <laughs> well, see, what I was doing was, uh, I, I, I was driving to see a friend and my, my truck overheated and, and and so I just thought I would walk around and 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 until it cooled off. And then I was gonna be on my way. Just just gonna walk around till my truck cooled off. I'm gonna be on my way. Come on, Gerald. Come on, Gerald. And so you know, in his mind, he's like thinking. It's three o'clock in the morning. I'm in a graveyard in Mississippi. What is the Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office doing out here asking me questions? So then, in his little mind, he's like, well, if the Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office, which y'all in Louisiana, we don't have counties, we have parishes. So when I say Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office, that's it would be like the county sheriff. So, Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office is in Denham Springs, mm -hmm. and he's realizing that they've done followed him to Gloucester, Mississippi. So he's like, oh shit, I'm a suspect. Right? So now he, he realizes he's a suspect. So they call him to the Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office for an interview and he does he shows up the fbi and the livingston parish sheriff's office had gotten together and they had gotten his sister and jennifer his wife and they the police had given jennifer and gerald's sister scripts to follow and they're like we want you to go in there one at a time his sister went in there first jennifer went in there second and they told them, they said, when you go in there, we, you need to go by this script. So they had to memorize the script and go in there. And one of the main things on the script was that they were each to like look him directly in the eye and say, we believe that you had something to do with this. We believe that you had something to do with Courtney's disappearance. That, that was the main thing out of the script. They, they wanted to make sure Luke Gerald in his eyeballs. We believe that you had something to do with Courtney's disappearance. Okay? Okay. So his sister and Jennifer, Courtney's mom, both go in there and do that. So the police go in there to talk to him after the sister... And then Jennifer, after they both go in, do their, we believe you had something to do with this. 
And when the police go in there, he's like not saying nothing and his behavior is like really defiant and just like he just doesn't care and he's just like, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell y'all anything mm -mm, kind of thing. Just, you know, basically that kind of thing. Just like I ain't telling y'all shit. I guess, I don't know how long the interrogation was. I don't know how long they waited him out, but when he finally decided to speak up and stop being a, an asshole, he said, I want to talk to my sister again. And the cop said, no, oh no, 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 Gerald, this is not how this goes, no. And he's like, I just, I just want to talk to my sister. I just, there's just something that I need to tell her. There's just, just one thing I need to tell her. And so one of the detectives was like, if we take you to talk to your sister, cause she's gone by now. She's like going back to her house. If we take you to talk to your sister, will you tell us what happened to Courtney? And he says, yes, yes. And so they're like, bow time. So they drive him to his sister's house and because they don't want like a hostage situation going on, they leave him in the back of the cop car. And even though the cop like gets out of the car and they, you know, they walk his sister out to the cop car and like crack the window so she can talk to him. Um, so I guess like they give them some privacy or whatever because when I saw the interview with the, the cops, and of course, I mean, they could be, you know, holding us back from any interviews, you know, with the media, even though this is like years after everything had went down. They said that they still don't know what what he said to his sister. Um, and so after he talks to his sister and says whatever he needs to say, the detective's like, we held up our part of the bargain. Now it's your turn. Where is Courtney? What did you, what happened? Y'all, this disgusting piece of garbage human, he said, remember I told y'all he was an electrician. He said that he was on standby for work and since, you know, he didn't really have anything to do, he figured he'd go by Jennifer's house, you know, and hang out with her until he had some work to do. Now, I don't know how much I believe this because with him and Jennifer still being in contact, you know dang well that she probably had told him, my brother's in an accident, I'm at the hospital, something. You know he knew, he knew, he either staked it out, he, did, he knew Courtney was gonna be by herself. Cause like I told you, her two other sisters did not live with her, just Courtney. So, he just creeps up in Jennifer's house and remember Courtney's there by herself because she had a book report to do. And he said when he opened the door, Courtney was asleep on the couch. So he goes to his favorite move. He pulls a knife out of the kitchen and he shakes her awake and he snatches her up and he tells her like, quote, if you scream, if you holler, if you try to get away, I will kill you. That baby's 12 years old. This is her stepdad doing this to her. She's got to be terrified, terrified. You know, not only did her mom, even after she told her mom what he had done to her, her mama was just like, I'm gonna stay with him anyway. So he had all kind of access to her, you know, just whenever he wanted to, God knows what else happened to the baby that she didn't tell anybody, but he snatched her up with a knife, put her in his truck, told her she hollered he was gonna kill her. 
And then he said he drove her to Gloucester, Mississippi. So apparently that's one of his favorite places. And when they got there, he said that he forced her to perform oral S on him. I don't I don't know how it's to put it with you know without YouTube getting mad, but I'm not sure I believe this. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Well, because he's a piece of garbage anyway. So why are you gonna believe him? But I'll tell you why in a minute. Why I don't, I don't, I don't believe that's all he did. Which I mean, it's enough. That's enough for him to do that. But still, he drives her Mississippi, forces her to perform oral s on him, and then drives her back to Louisiana and drives her to the woods. And she's like, why do you like the woods? This is what he's telling them. Courtney asked him, why do you like the woods? Like, why are we going to the woods? And he's just like, I used to love coming here whenever I was a little boy. And as they were walking through the woods, he chokes her from behind. So he strangles her and kills her. When she wasn't looking. He just comes up behind her and, and chokes her and she dies. And he leaves her there. Okay. This is 11 days later that he's telling the police this. 11 days later. And so they're like, okay, well, can you show us where she is? And remember they're like at his sister's house just chilling sitting right there and he's like yeah it's like five minutes up the road and they're like what so y'all he left her next to the amy river on the east baton rouge parish side and i know that most of y'all that are watching this are not from this area but the way that it works is that the Amy River separates Livingston Parish from East Baton Rouge Parish, mm -hmm. which Jennifer and Courtney lived in Denham Springs, which is in Livingston Parish. Mm -hmm. So there's two main ways out of Livingston Parish into East Baton Rouge Parish, and that is the interstate or Highway 190, which is better known as like Florida Boulevard. And either way you go, Interstate or Highway 190, you have to cross a bridge. That bridge is the Amy River Bridge. It separates Lemmingston Parish from East Baton Rouge Parish. He had put her on the East Baton Rouge Parish side. I don't know if he's thinking like, well, she lives on the Livingston Parish side, so if they're looking for her, they won't find her if I put her on the East Baton Rouge Parish side, you know, because maybe the water will come up or she'll turn to bones or, cause it had been 11 days. So she was really badly decomposed as it was. So, he tells them, turn here. It's like on this dirt road. And they get out and they get him out and he walks the police like two to three hundred yards into the woods and then he just stops and this weirdo cannot even say like she's over there or point to where she is and like you'll find her in that direction no mm -mm. no he doesn't say a word to them he just stops like two to three hundred yards in, he just stops and goes, just cocks his head, just nods his head in a. So they go off in the direction that he nodded his head in and they find Courtney. And when they find her, all she has on is a pair of shorts and one sock. This is why I said that I don't believe him when he said he brought her to Mississippi and, and forced her to provide 
oral S on him. That's why I said that I don't believe that's all that he did to her. I don't. I don't believe him. I, mm -mm, mm -mm. No, she's found with just a pair of shorts and one sock on. I don't believe that's all he did to her. I don't. Sorry. Sorry, Gerald. I don't believe you. I don't. Okay. So, now they finally found Courtney. This poor baby. She'd been gone 11 days. She's 12 years old. She's a child. I know I keep saying that, but she is a child. Tw Did I say 11? She's 12 years old. She is a child. A 12-year-old is a child. She's not even a teenager yet. Not even a teenager yet. It just, it just makes me so angry. So angry. So angry. Okay. So they found this sweet baby girl, Courtney. And Gerald goes to jail. And of course, since he's a chomo, I hope so, because it just did. Since he's one of those, he gets put in segregation. And when he finally goes to trial in 2006, it doesn't take long for the jury to find him guilty. And he's sentenced to death. When you get a sense of, it's like, over 10 years or over 20 years, you're automatically gonna go to Angola. It's officially called Louisiana State Penitentiary, but everybody calls it Angola. Like I think even everybody like across the nation, across the world probably knows it as Angola. Like it's, you don't wanna go to Angola. You don't wanna go to Angola, unless it's for the rodeo. You don't wanna go. Mm -mm. So he was sentenced to death. And you know when you get sentenced to death, you have all these appeals that you can go through. Gerald was like, mm -mm, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not doing it. Mm -mm. Not doing it. Not doing it. Like he waived all of his appeals. And he said, I think his lawyer's name was Jill Craft. Through her, he, he was like, no. No appeals. Because if you overturn my conviction, I'm going to do the same thing the moment I have the chance to do it. So, it was rare for them to waive any of his appeals, but they did. When he was on death row, Derek Todd Lee, one of the two serial killers I was talking about at the beginning of this video, which I'll do a, I'll do a video on him but there's probably a bunch of videos on, on him. Um, and I'm also do one on Sh Sean Vincent Gillis, who was also a serial killer at the same time. I think I talked about that. Anyway, it was said that Derek Todd Lee was Gerald Borlone's neighbor on death row and that Derek Todd Lee tormented him every single day. Tormented the shit out of him, which, fantastic. Even though Derek Todd Lee piece of garbage as well. So we're creeping up on Gerald's execution date, which his execution date is January 7th of 2010. And I think it's, I think it's 24 hours before they execute you. They move you to a different jail cell and you have human eyeballs on you, you know, like, even though the, the the cell is like stripped of anything that you could harm yourself with. So, um, like I told y'all, he was in Angola and the warden of Angola is Burl Kane. So, Warden Kane is what we're gonna call him. His name is Burl Kane. Uh, Gerald wanted to make a couple of phone calls like the day before his execution and since the people were not on his visitation list which a lot of people on death row get to have visitors 
the people they kill don't don't get to see their family or anybody for that matter just just a quick thought of mine anyway so the day before he is gonna be executed <clears throat> He wants to make phone calls, and the phone calls are to people that are not on his visitation list. So the warden has to approve these phone calls, and the warden's like, who do you want to call? And the first person he wanted to call was the lady that took Courtney home. Remember I told you uh, Jennifer, Courtney's mom, was staying the night at the hospital because her brother had gotten in a wreck, and Courtney wanted to go home with this lady because she had a book report to finish and she talked that lady into bringing her to her own home like to Courtney's house instead of going to stay with this lady and uh, y'all know she had to feel so bad that was who he wanted to call so the warden was like okay I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you call her but I'm gonna be on the line because you know he didn't want no no funny business going on so Gerald calls this woman that was supposed to take Courtney home that night but Courtney, you know, talked her into taking her to her own, to Courtney's house instead. And he told the woman, he said, look, this was not your fault. Just because you didn't take Courtney to your house, just because you took her home to her house, to Courtney's house, it is not your fault. He said, I would have found a way. I would have stalked that house. I would have done anything I could to find a way to make this happen. So please don't blame yourself. And then he wanted to make another phone call. And the warden's like, I'm going to listen to this one too because I don't know. So apparently this other woman he called was, I think she had some questions about whether or not Gerald had done anything to her daughter. And so he called her and he was like, look, I want to let you know nothing ever happened you a ask your daughter sit her down talk to her i never did anything i want to let you know before you know i go to get lethal injection tomorrow i just want to let you know that i never did anything to your child which anyway i guess he was trying to do some some good deeds before the you know the day before he before he was addicted so we're at execution day january 7th 2010. Courtney's mother, Jennifer, her uncle, the one that had been in the car wreck, and Courtney's older sister, the one that had also been inappropriately touched by Gerald, all came to witness his execution, along with some of his family members and, you know, his lawyer and whatever. So he tells Courtney's, like, because when you witness the execution, like, there's this window and they have speakers that they can turn on and off and to Courtney's mom, sister, and uncle, he told them like, quote, I'm sorry, this never should have happened. I don't know if that brings you peace or closure, but I'm sorry. And he was crying as he said it. And as he's still crying, he's like, I also want to apologize to my family for the hurt that I've caused you and after he says all of that they close these black curtains that are on the you know the window that are separate that it that separates the the audience from the prisoner and seven men move in they close the black curtain, they move in, and they strap him up to the IVs and all of that kind of stuff. And Warden Kane is in there with him. Gerald's crying, and he's telling him the, the same thing that he had told the family members. Like, please, you know, I'm so sorry for my actions. Please make sure they know that I'm sorry. And after everything is hooked up, they open that curtain so that the family members and lawyers and whoever else is witnessing this execution <clears throat> after they hook up the IVs and all of that they open the curtains back up so that they can see the prisoner again and Warden Kane's in there with the prisoner and the other seven guys that are you know doing all this and as the medicine's going through him and he's talking to Warden Kane and saying 
please, 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 please make sure they know I'm so sorry. And at 6.32 p.m. on January 7th, 2010, Gerald Bordelon was pronounced dead. He was 47 years old. Warden Kane looks out and he says, Gerald Bordelon, we now pronounce Gerald Bordelon dead. We send his soul for final judgment. Okay, so we got through that. Gerald, deceased. For those of y'all wondering, Jennifer Bordelon, Courtney's mom, Gerald's wife, got some consequences of her own. In 2003, one year after they found Courtney's body, she was charged with felonious child neglect for exposing her three children to Gerald, that monster, the monster. So they did charge her with that. She was facing 20 years. She got five years probation, five years probation. That's what she got. It, she got some consequences, but I'm not happy with it because I think you know, Courtney's, she doesn't get any more years. She doesn't get any more anything, but you know, what, what, what can you do? But let me know if y'all want to hear about Derek Todd Lee. I'm definitely doing Sean Vincent Gillis. If there's any more true crime stories or paranormal stories, anything like that that you want to hear about, let me know. Comments, DM, whichever and I will get on top of them. And I will research, I like doing research. I just realized how much I like doing research when I was researching, researching this one. So y'all let me know what you wanna hear about and I will do a video on it. Thanks for watching. Y'all have a wonderful day.